I'm going to talk some about the history of Centralia. Uh, me and my other half went up there a couple of days ago. And it's a very beautiful place. It's very sad what has happened up there. I'm going to be talking all the way from the early history up to today. If you decide to go to Centralia, please do understand it is still dangerous up there. There could still be places that the ground could cave in. Uh, take somebody with you. Don't go alone. Don't take anything up there with you and out of your vehicle that could get laid on the ground as trash. It's been trashed out enough. <coughs> there are people that still live there. So please be respectful. Don't be walking around on the yards. Uh, stay on the streets. If you see a resident, whether they're current or former, I guarantee you if they want to talk to you, they will come up and talk to you. So now on to the history part of it. The history starts with Native American tribes in what is now Columbia County. They sold land that makes up Centralia to colonial agents in 1749 for the sum of 500 pounds. In 1970 area, during the construction of the Reading Road, which stretched from Reading, Pennsylvania to Fort Augusta, which is now present-day Sunbury, Pennsylvania. Uh, settlers, they surveyed and explored the land. Uh, a large portion of the Reading Road was later developed into Route 61. That is the highway that runs east-south into Centralia. In 1793, Robert Morris, and if you paid attention in history class, you recognize his name because he is a hero from the Revolutionary War, and he was also one of the people who signed on the Declaration of Independence. He acquired a third of Centralia's Valley land. Later, he declared bankruptcy right around 1798. The land of his, when he declared bankruptcy, it was surrendered to the Bank of the United States. And it was in 1798 that the bankruptcy happened. And from that, he was sent to debtor's prison. Later... And I don't know by how much later, but later after that, a French sea captain by the name of, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce the right name last, Stephen Gerard, he purchased the land that Morris had that he lost in the bankruptcy for about $30,000. That included 68 tracks east of Morris's. Stefan learned about the anthracite coal in the region. Uh, the Centralia coal deposits were, large, were largely overlooked before because there was no way to transport them. Around the time of 1854, uh, the Mine Run Railroad started being brought into the area. In 1832, Jonathan Frost Bost opened the Bull's Head Tavern, what is now called Roaring Creek Township. That was pretty much the first name given to the town. It was Bull's Head in 1842. Centralia's land was bought then by the Locust Mountain Coal and Iron Company 
Alexandra Ray, who was a mining engineer, moved his family in and began began to plan the village. Uh, he laid out streets and lots for develop for developments. Ray named the town Centerville, but 1865 that changed to Centralia because the U.S. Post Office already had a Centerville in Schoolville County. The Mine Run Railroad was built in 1854 to transport coal out of the valley. Okay, when it comes to the borough of Centralia in Conningham Township on the mining aspect of things, Conningham was the seventh and last township that was formed out of the original territory of Catawissa. There was an embrace successfully in the Roaring Creek in the Locust, Locust, uh, the extreme south part of the county, at the February Court in 1856. Um, there was then a township building erected of Conningham. I will leave the links in the description of the video so that you can go through and read all the research I was able to compile. I am not going to go through and summarize it all into the video. Um, in Conningham, after the township was erected, it was named in honor of the President Judge Honorable... Jim Nesbitt Conningham. And by unforeseen consequence, the township, which pre, pre yeah, I'm not going to make that word, pronunciates his name, was formed at the last session in Bloomsburg, over which he presided. The property that he had in his upright character and his unswer unswerving in integrity is attested by his immense ability to untarnish record and as a impractable judge and an honorable man. Conningham Township is not that far from uh, Centralia, and Ashland is not that far from Centralia, and both of those neighboring towns hold a lot of history when it comes to Centralia. Nearly the whole town of Conningham Township was surveyed about the years 1793. At that time, no one would have even had an idea about the vast mineral resources. And for this time frame, it was like that in all of the area. It wasn't later on until closer to the 1900s when the coal companies started forming because people started to realize that coal was an actual, you know, commodity that we could use and... I believe for this area of Pennsylvania that I'm talking about, and that's the Centralia area, 
the first coal companies did not start to form until around the 1830s and coal was still not really known widely as a commodity back then. Uh, in one of the links that I'm going to be posting in this video, there's going to be a chart after you click the link and open up the website and it's going to have a list in there of the coal mines and they'll have it as name of colliery and that will be for around the 1882 area and it's going to list the location and the operator and the amount of tons that were hauled out of the mine. And since this is about Centralia, there was several collieries at this time in Centralia. One of them was Hazel Dell. It was owned by L.A. Riley and Company. Over 7,000 tons of coal was pulled out of there. Another one was the Continental by Lehigh Valley Coal Company. That hauled out over 1,600 tons of coal. The Montana Number no. 1. It was done by Daniel Beaver. And that one was abandoned. Uh, there's a Logan mine that was ran by the L.A. Riley and Company. You, you'll you be able to see all the mines on the list. And there's a lot of them in there for, for Centralia. There's lots and lots of reading material that you can just immerse yourself in and learn some of the stuff that so far from what I've been able to find from watching videos is just not covered um like in 18 in 1855 Alexander W Rhea who was one of the first engineers and an agent of the Locust Mountain Coal and Iron Company. He built a cottage above the hotel and removed Thith Thither from Danville. He had made surveys uh, for several uh, street parcels. And that had to do around with the Reading Road and others crossing it at right angles. Um, Roe built a house later that year. Um, the, well, he built many houses later that year. And they were all lived in by employees of the company. Um, later on, the houses were removed, but that was practically the beginning of, uh, you know, Centralia. Uh, in 1865, you had the Lehigh and the Mokanoi Railroad, also known as the Lehigh Valley. Uh, it was built through the town on what now is known as Railroad Avenue. You could probably look that up on Google Maps and be able to find it. Um, after the train came in, it started to help growth in the town. The population began to grow. The town got bigger and the wealth got better too, even though the coal mining was technically a very dangerous, you know, line of work. You would see the family sticking together and 
and that was because you never knew if your man of the house was going to come home from the mine for that day or not. Uh, the mine production, and it did slow down in World War One, and that was mainly because of the fact that a lot of the men went off to war. The mining had already been starting to slow down as it had been. Um, when it came to the start of the fire, which was right around their memorial day celebration when it started the uh new dump that they had they had not used it the year before and that was the first year that they had started to burn trash in that dump <clears throat> I do not know for sure how many mines might have at one time been opened. I do know that back before the 1860s, there were several murders that took place and several arsons. And apparently Centralia had been a hotbed for the Molly Maguires. Um, apparently it had something to do with the miners trying to organize a work union to improve the wages and the working conditions. Um, I found in the research that there is a legend that runs among the locals there in Centralia of a story of Father Daniel Ig Ig Ignatimus McDermott, who was their first Roman Catholic priest to call Centralia home. Um, he apparently cursed the land in retaliation um, for being assaulted by three members of the Maguires in 1869. He did say that there would be a day when the St. Ign Ignatius Roman Catholic Church would be the only remaining structure standing in Centralia. From the Google map that I saw, I cannot identify the church but there looks to be what is five homes on the google map and one community building of some kind uh, many of the molly maguires uh, their leaders were hung in 1877 and after that their crimes pretty much ended um there is legend that uh, some of the descendants from the Centralia area and some of the descendants that still live in Centralia are actually descendants of the Molly Maguires. And apparently they lived there until sometime around the 1980s. Um, according to the federal census, the town of Centralia reached its maximum population of 2,761 uh, residents in 1890. Um, at this time, the church had approximately seven churches, five hotels, 27 salons, saloons. Uh, two theaters, a bank, a post office, and 14 general and grocery stores. 
uh, about 37 years after that 1890 census, the production of the anthracite coal had reached its peak in Pennsylvania. And in the following years, the production just declined, uh, especially as World War I came about and many of the young miners from Centralia in other areas enlisted into the military to help fight. Now, in response to the downslide of coal and not as many people having the demand for it, new forms of energy did arrive on the market. Um, you probably think of oil and gas when you hear that, and you are right. It is cheap fuel oil. Um, it has high heat, it's relatively clean burning, and the more popular it got, the less popular coal got. And then things got even harder for the coal miners when the Wall Street crash of 1929 happened. Uh, that resulted in the Lehigh Valley Coal Company closing five of the Centralia local mines. Uh, when that happened, bootleg miners continued mining in several of the idle mines. And they used a technique which is called pillar, robber, pillar robbing. It's where miners left pillars of coal as roof support so it was really easy to be gotten to but the problem with this is once you took that pillar support out you really risked the chances of collapse and it also did not help in combating the mine fire in 1962 <clears throat> Efforts to seal off the abandoned mines that did not 100% successfully work, at least when it came to helping to stop the progression of the mine fire. It, it's almost impossible to totally seal off an abandoned mine where even air isn't going to get into it because of all the cracks and crevices that that are just naturally there in the ground and with the way that the coal veins run they run up and down with the topography of the earth so some of your veins might only be a couple of feet of you know below ground level um in 1950 the centralia Council acquired the right to all the anthracite coal beneath Centralia through a state law passed in 1949 that enabled the transaction. Um, that year, the federal census counted 1,986 residents in Centralia. Mining continued in Centralia until 1960. Uh, that was when most of the companies shut down. Bootleg mining continued until 80, 1982. And strip and open pit mining are still active in the area. Uh, there is an underground mine about three miles West, um, that at the time that it was published from the research I got, that mine that was about three miles away was still active and employed right around 40 people. Uh, Centralia area, they were showing conditions before the mine fire um p 
people had already been leaving the town and that had been making it hard as it was, you know, that the jobs were bad, you know, without the mining companies running, you pretty much had to go to Harrisburg for work and from Centralia, that would be right around a 120 mile trip, uh, round trip just to go to work and come home. Um, Centralia did have its own school district. It operated an elementary school, at least one elementary school and a high school. Uh, there were also two Catholic schools. Um, the mine fire from the research I have been able to do, it's still not fully understood exactly how the mine fire started. There are three main theories that people have gone to and if there are more theories, I have not heard of them. The first theory is they the, the borough of Centralia wanted to clean up their dump before their Memorial Day celebrations. And apparently this was either a new place in the dump that they were going to burn trash or they had moved their dump all the way together to another section of land in town. There was supposed to be a clay barrier put down in between the layers of gl of trash and from the way I understood it there was supposed to even be the clay barrier below the first layer of trash. And for reasons that how I read it in the research was that they fell short for whatever reason of getting the clay burial barrier all the way down before uh, they wanted to do their trash burn. It left a gap for the fire to get down into a coal seam. The borough of Centralia hired five members of the volunteer fire company to clean up the landfill. And they were going to do this by burning it in... Apparently, this was going to be burned in an abandoned stripe strip mine pit next to the Odd Fellows Cemetery, just outside of the borough limits. And like I said, this had been done in previous years, but the landfill, at least the burn, was in a different location. On May 27th, 1962, uh, the firefighters, as they had in the past, set the dump on fire and let it burn. But unlike previous years, the fire was not all the way extinguished. And an unsealed opening in the mine allowed the fire to enter and start the mine fire in the abandoned coal mine in the what grew to the abandoned coal mines beneath Centralia. <clears throat> um, there is also the theory of there was a trash hauler that had gone in there a couple of days before the trash burn and the trash hauler was apparently hauling hot ashes or discarded coal from coal burners and the trash hauler 
poured it into, dumped it into the open pit. Um, apparently that incident, uh, was noted in the borough council minutes from June 4th, 1962, um, referring to two fires at the dump at that fire, at that five firefighters had submitted bills for fighting the fire in the landfill area. Um, now, to the clay barriers I was talking about, in the borough, by law, they were responsible for installing a fire-resistant clay barrier beneath each layer of landfill, but they fell behind schedule, uh, which left the barrier incomplete. Which, in other words, it allowed the hot coals to penetrate the cola vein underneath the pit and start the, the fire. And it wasn't too much longer after that that the residents of Centralia could start to see that there was a fire raging in the coal seam beneath. Um... It spread into tunnels beneath the town street and the local mines closed to the unsafe carbon monoxide levels. And if you don't know what carbon monoxide is, uh, when you inhale carbon monoxide, it binds to your red blood cells and your red blood cells are what carries oxygen throughout your body, your red blood cells will release the oxygen as the your blood moves and pushes the red blood cells along. Well, carbon monoxide inhibits your body when the red blood cells are letting off the oxygen to be able to absorb that oxygen. So, you literally suffocate from the inside out from carbon monoxide because the air that you breathe in is not being distributed to the rest of your body. Uh, multiple attempts were made to excavate and put out the fire. All of them failed. Uh, I remember seeing in one video... There were some former residents of Centralia talking about when they had came in and tried to dig out the fire and extinguish it. And on one of them, the planning was off and the trench landed right behind where the fire was. And they wanted the trench out ahead of the fire to stop the fire. And the funding had ran out. So the trench didn't move any further. And by the time more money was allotted, uh, the fire was already through more area than what it could financially be given to try to stop the fire in a conventional means for back in the 60s. Um, the third theory, and these are the theories I'm finding a lot in the research. The third theory says that the uh, Bast Colony Fire of 1932 was never fully extinguished. I have not researched the Bass Colony Fire, uh, so I'm not really able to tell much about that, but the way this theory goes is if it was never fully extinguished and that the fire reached the landfill area by 1962, that that is how the present day Centralia caught fire underground and has been burning ever since. 
Uh, there is, however, one man by the name of Jergil. He claims he operated a bootleg mine with his brother near the landfill from 1960 to 1962 and basically said that if the bass if the base bast if the bass culinary fire had not been extinguished that uh they would have not likely you know made it out they probably would have been overcome or killed by noxious gases uh via many interconnecting tunnels in the area Um, when it came to the firefighting aspect of trying to put out the uh, fire, they really could not do it conventionally like what you would think of, of, you know, them pulling fire trucks up and starting to spray something down with water. Um, the mining and all that. The, the ore is honeycombed in the ground and it will go up and down and side to side and to be able to flood it 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 would have taken longer to get barriers set up so that when they started to flood the mines the, the water wouldn't just start coming pouring out another section of the mine that the fire would have already spread on. Um, they, they did go through and use some water on it. Um, when they did put water on it, uh, later on they would find out that the fire had flared up again and was burning again by the next day. Uh, Sometime in June of that year, one of the residents of Centralia notified authorities of the problem and some money was made available to move garbage around in the dump and wet it again. Um, people think at this time, however, that the fire was already, you know, in the coal veins, um... When they moved the trash around in the dump and wet it down, it did appear to work for a short time. The fire, it was stubborn though, kept coming back. And they later found out that it had already spread beyond the landfill and deeper into the coal mines below the town. Um... In November of 1962, they had the first real effort to drill into the fire and flush it out with water. Uh, by the spring of 1963, the project ran out of money before the fire was fully contained. And when they say contained, they mean a barrier around the fire they don't mean that it's extinguished. Um, budget cuts in the Pennsylvania Department of Mines and Mineral Industries, also called DMMI, uh, those, they were able to help impact uh, what was being done too because before 63, they were not dealing with their budget cuts, and in 63, the DMMI started getting their budget cuts. Um, in 63, 1963, a new plan was drawn up, and this time they would dig the, tr the trench to form a barrier between the fire and the town of Centralia. Uh, this project continued through the summer until it was determined the fire had already crossed the barrier um, with the trench felling, with the trench 
failing, it was back to the drawing board. Um, they tried again to do something about the fire and came up with a more extensive plan. Uh, a lot of valuable time had been lost in the, in the uh, years that it took to acquire the approvals. Uh, property releases and funding. Um, this effort to fight the mine fire finally got underway in May of 1967. Um, while drilling it was soon discovered that the fire was as deep as 225 feet into the earth. Um... That made it too deep for a trench to effectively block it. Another revised plan was drawn up and would be more extensive. Use of flush barriers made of crushed stone and water. Uh, by 1967, residents, especially those along Wood Street, they were growing more concerned more concerned uh the fire was getting closer to their home um they pressured the centralia uh borough council to act uh the council in turn pressured the united states bureau of mines to do something more Eventually, it was learned that the flush barriers were to be replaced with experimental fly ash barriers. Um, that project did not begin until 1969. Fly ash, for anyone who doesn't know, it is a byproduct from burning coal in power plants. Uh, today, the use of fly ash is highly controversial. Um, it's been found it gives off toxic, toxic fumes. Uh, uh, nineteen sixty nine was also the year residents began to feel effects of the mine fire under Centralia. Um, at least several of the residents started to suffer from headaches and nausea. Um, some of the residents agreed to have, uh, small trenches dug around their homes to protect, to protect their homes along Wood Street. Um, that was by 1969. Uh, there were more extensive fly bar fly ash barriers. Uh, those were completed in 1974. Uh, however, um, barriers had already felled as early as 1972. Uh, at that time, the fire was detected beyond it, and additional emergency funds were required to shore it up. Uh, for the next few years, a mine fire problem in Centralia kept going. Uh, for many years, people suspected that the fly ash barrier had been breached and the fire was still moving under the town. The Bureau of Mines, however, still tries to ignore the problem um, officials say that the barrier, uh, was a success. And then by 1977, they would no longer be able to deny the threat residents faced from the growing mine fire. Uh, in 1979 is right around the time that the mine fire 
started making news headlines. Uh, a gas station owner, then John Goddington, he inserted a dipstick into one of his underground tanks to check the level of the gasoline. And he, you know, thought it felt hot. He lowered a thermometer into the tank on a string. And quite to his surprise, he discovered the temperature of, of the gasoline in the tank was 172 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is more than enough heat to cause gasoline, whether it be the actual liquid or the vapors to burn. Um, there are reports that ground beneath the city itself became hotter and hotter. Some reports indicate reaching over 900 degrees Fahrenheit in some location. Uh, smoke poured from sinkholes and filled basements. Uh... Residents started having health problems and their homes began to tilt. Um, apparently, some of the graves in two of the town's cemeteries are believed to have dropped into the abyss of fire that raged below them. In eight in nineteen eighty one was when Centralia really started to get the attention. This was when a twelve year old resident uh named Todd Domboski fell into a sinkhole that was four feet wide by a hundred and fifty feet deep. Um the sinkhole suddenly opened beneath his feet in the backyard. Uh, his cousin, 14-year-old Eric Wolfgang, pulled him out of the hole and saved his life. The hot plume of steam billowed from the hole. Uh, it was tested and found to contain lethal levels of carbon monoxide. Uh, this here was the start of the government uh, coming in. It, they looked at the issue, uh, ran models on paper of doing troubleshooting, and they decided that the cheapest, most effective way to solve this problem would be to relocate the town and pay people for their house and their property and give them a moving allowance and just let the fire burn. So, in 1983, the U.S. Congress allow allocated more than $42 million uh, for the relocation efforts. Um, it's my understanding that more than a thousand people, which would be nearly all of the residents, accepted the government buyout offers. And they moved out of the town and 500 structures were demolished. In 1990, according to the census record, 63 residents remained, uh, in 1992, Pennsylvania Governor Bob Casey invoked eminent domain on all property in the borough, condemning all the buildings within. Um, the residents who were still living there, they took legal actions uh, to try to overturn this, but their actions failed. In 2002, the U.S. Postal Service uh, was dis 
discontinued from Centralia, uh, and Centralia lost their zip code at that time too. Centralia's zip code was one seven nine two seven. Um, in 2006, there were 16 homes left standing, which was reduced to 11 in 2009 when Governor Ed Rendell began, began the formal, formal eviction of remaining Centralia residents. In 2010, only five homes remained. Uh, the Centralia Mine Fire extended beneath the village of Bur Burnsville. If I didn't pronounce that correct, somebody please correct me in the comments. Uh, that was just a short distance to the south and also required that town to be abandoned. Um, people have gone to Centralia and taken video and pictures of the toxic gas and smoke rising out from the ground. Uh, they've taken pictures of the houses that were there. Um... The only indication of the fire, which underlies some 400 acres, uh, which is spreading along four fronts, are low, round metal steam vents in the south end of the borough. Several signs warn of underground fire, unstable ground, and dangerous levels of carbon monoxide. Additional smoke and steam can be seen coming from the abandoned portion of Pennsylvania Route 61, the area just behind the Hilltop Cemetery and other cracks in the ground scatter about the area. Route 61 was repaired several times until it closed. Um, I have heard people talking about the smoke and steam coming up, and apparently you can hear it best, or you can see it best on a really cold day. Uh, sinkholes even cause an entire stretch of highway to be rerouted after holes and gas buckled back in 1994. Uh, the state did its best to hide the old highway uh, and because of the danger lurking beneath it, they never got rid of it. Uh, it's still there. Um, that's like pretty much like all that's really left of Centralia anymore. It's the roads going through it. Uh, the five houses, uh, the one building that looks like it might have been a community building, uh, they have, um, a little area alongside the new part of Route 61 that a church has gone through and put a religious site in, um, the underground fire is still burning and it may continue to do so for another 250 years. Uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania did not n renew the relocation contract at the end of 2005. Uh, in 2007, uh, the last remaining house on Locust avenue was demolished um it was notable because of the five chimney like support buttresses uh along each of two opposing sides of the house um that house had 
formerly been um, a row of homes. And as other people moved out, they demolished the empty homes and put up the support structures around that one. Um, you uh, might have heard of John Komarnsky and John Lokiest Jr. Uh, they were evicted in May and July of 2009. Uh, in May of 2009, the remaining residents mounted another legal effort to reverse the 1992 eminent domain claim. And again in 2010, only five homes remained. As state officials tried to um, vacate the remaining residents and demolish what was left of the town. In March uh, 2011, a federal judge refused to issue an injunction that would have stopped the condemnment. Uh, the borough council, as of 2011, was still having regular meetings. It was reported then that their highest bill at the meeting uh, was a PP&L uh, power utility bill at $92.00. For anyone who doesn't who doesn't know, P P and L stands for Pennsylvania Light and Power. Uh, that officially put the town budget in the black. Um, in February two thousand and twelve, the Commonwealth Court ruled that a declaration of taking could not be reopened or set aside on the basis that the purpose for the condemnment no longer exists. Seven people, including the borough council president, has filed suits claiming the condemnation was no longer needed because the underground fire had moved on and the air quality was the same as that in Lancaster. On October 2013, the remaining residents settled their lawsuit, receiving $218,000 in compensation for the value of their homes, along with $131,500 to settle additional claims and the right to stay in their homes for the rest of their lives. Um... That right there pretty much sums up what has happened here. I did find one story, and I'll have it linked in the, the comments. You can click the link. And a woman was telling her story of how Centralia started getting more attention and fame because of the fire than anything else and when she was living there in her younger days which uh, from what I understood she she moved out of Centralia um, sometime in her 20s but while she was in uh, grade school apparently Centralia had became a very popular Halloween vacation uh, destination because a lot of people wanted to be scared and with how it seems like our you know culture likes the horror houses and everything else at Halloween time I can understand that I, I really do think it's a shame what has happened here to Centralia because this could have been your town. This could have my, been my town. This town. It was home to a lot of people. They felt safe. Uh, for some people. There had been four or five generations. Living in that town. And. Their family had never known. 
living anywhere else. They felt they had it made in their town. And then here comes along this disaster in the name of a mine fire. And every step of effort that was made, whether it be through the town or the local government or the federal government, it seemed to just be a a couple of steps too far behind. And it's like people in the governments said, hey, you know, we're tired of fighting this, you know, you're, you know, we're just wasting our money trying to fight it. It would be, you know, cheaper for you to forget all about your town and just take the money and move somewhere else. Well, you have now the story of Centralia and what happened. And if it makes you mad that this has happened to them and all of these people have pretty much really lost uh, the family history that they have now in this town. You know, it. if you were born in Centralia and you grew up in Centralia, you cannot take your grandkids back to Centralia today and say, you know, this is your great-grandparents' house. This is where I grew up, you know. And, you know, this is the backyard that we used to go play in. And... You know, there's the maple tree that we hung the tire swing from and we'd swing in the summer because it's not there now. So, if what you heard today upsets you, I urge you do something about this. Share this video with your friends, with your family. Um, if you're really mad about it, you know... Find your local congressman. Say something to him. You know, it, this is basically an environmental mess that we have not cleaned up. We decided to cover it up. I will put the links in the description. And I will see you back at the next video. And if you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing. Thank you.